Well, I, I just want to start in the one place that matters most to you, matters most to me. It's the thing that we want actually the most over all things. What's the most important thing to you? That's what we have to know, what we need more than anything. The question that we all have is, do I really matter and can I be loved for who I am? That's the question. That's what everybody wants. I don't care who you are, where you come from, what continent you're from, what race you are, gender you are. This is the most critical question every person asks. That's what they really want to know. Do I actually matter and can I actually be loved for who I am? You want to be loved no matter what. I want to be loved no matter what. You might use different language to describe it. If you're a rough and tough dude, you might use words like uh, honored or respected. Or maybe if you're a leader of an organization, you might say things like valued or appreciated. But what we all want deep down is a longing to be loved for who we are. That's what we want, for people to be able to see us and know us and to love us no matter what. It's what we'll uh, hope for in our spouses and from our children and among our friends. And there are ways that we get tastes of that here in this life. And yet, if you've been around any human for any amount of time, you'll figure out that they can't totally do it perfectly, can they? They can't. And we've all felt the deficiency of that. No one can do that perfectly for you. Therefore, there's this deficiency. We continually come up against the, this question. Am I actually, can I, could I be loved for who I am? Do I actually matter? And so because there's that deficiency, we often resort to chasing after things in order to get that, to feel that. We'll cave to peer pressure We'll lose ourselves even to be loved. <clears throat> Might even force ourselves to become another version of ourselves in order to be okay. Or when we don't feel loved, we often end up prone to all kinds of things in order to try to fill that desire, to fill that void. We'll, have, we'll uh, experience addictions to substances or to relationships or to achievements or whatever we can in order to get ourselves to a point of being accepted, loved. And so we all inherently have that question. Whether or not we're actually loved, because deep down, every one of us knows something. And here's what we know. We're all really broken, really imperfect. The reason that question resonates all the time is because we've all figured out we've fallen short. I don't know that I can be loved because I'm deficient. I've fallen short in some way. I've got flaws. I've got failures. I've got shortcomings. And we see the weight of it, and we can put on all the front, and look amazing on Instagram. But when it comes down to it, every one of us knows that we're flawed. That's why we have that question resonating. That's that broken place that every human actually comes from. And in, in, in fact, that's why we have so much in common in that regard. Now, I think there are probably many who would try to cover those kinds of things up. They wouldn't want up to own up to their brokenness. In fact, I've experienced quite a bit of that in my own life. So what we do is we'll self-protect and we don't want to be vulnerable about those things and try to act like maybe we've got all the things together. But the truth is, is you, we can't get away from it. We don't. We don't have it. And therefore, we have the question, can I actually be loved for who I am? It's the story that we never tell in the parties that we go to and the hangouts that we have, the brokenness that we all face. So the Bible tells it really succinctly for us, this condition or this place. Um, one, probably one of my favorite chapters in all of the scripture. 
Ephesians chapter two wants to just describe this for us and we'll put it on the screen in case you're at Matthew 16. It says, you were dead. You were dead. And trespasses and sins in which you once walked following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience among whom we all, all, everybody say all, all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Pause. It's bad news. You try to muster up all the love and encouragement that you can in this life would never be enough The scripture is saying, humanity, you and me, fundamentally broken. We're separated from the only one in whose image we were actually created and carrying out desires for what, right? We want to be loved. We want to find connection. We'll use our bodies. We'll use our minds. That's what the Bible's saying. The scripture's saying. You look at it right there. We use our bodies and use our minds to try to fill the void, try to make it work. But we cannot get there. Nothing is working. We were dead and broken and separated. Wow, Pastor, this is uplifting. Good. <laughs> Really good message. Glad I'm here. (laughs) The good news is there's an answer to that cry. There's There's good news that that brokenness and that shortcoming and that failure, that sadness, that loneliness can be eradicated and changed forever. Because the very next verse turns our world upside down. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 4. But God. Come on. I might get Pentecostal here in a minute. All right. Come on. But God. But God. You were a catastrophic mess. Dead. But God, but God, being rich in mercy because of the great love, great love with which he has loved us even when we were dead. Not after we pulled ourselves out of the broken pit because you and I couldn't do it. Even when we were dead and our trespasses made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Saved were a child of wrath. Now by grace and radical love have been saved And raised us up, not just saved, but then raised us up with him in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Wow. Wow. Because of the unmerited, freely given, radical love of God, you and I have been changed, changed, completely made different. How? Because you are now perfectly loved. The answer to that question that's burning inside of every human, do I actually matter and could I actually be loved for who I am? The answer to that question is no Doubt. Hear me. There's no deficiency right now in how radically loved you are. There is now no deficiency in how radically loved you are. You have been perfectly loved. 
You want an answer to that question? You thank God for spouses and kids and friends and all the ways you've experienced all the beautiful love that we get to have on this life among each other. But hear this. There is one whose love is never, ever deficient. You are fully, radically loved and accepted by him. Why? Because he took our broken, dead corpse of a life and made us alive, painted us in righteousness, poured into us holiness, transformed us fundamentally from the inside out. That is who we are. The love of God changed us from broken, cut off, and dead into loved sons and daughters and co-heirs with the Son of God. Dad gum. It's like the most churchy way you can say that. Dang. That might, if you've gotten to grow up in church, become kind of like the thing that you know until we get a just chance to step back and think about what this actually means in our lives. You quite literally could not be more loved in this life. This is who you are. You and I have been changed. You have a new identity, a brand new identity. This is what it means to be the church. This is what it means to be the church. It means to be changed. Changed fundamentally. And if you and I are going to thrive in the days ahead, it's time to see ourselves for what God has actually done in us. Let me say that again. If you and I are actually going to thrive in the days ahead, it won't have anything to do with your income or how good your relationships are or how many vacations you're able to go on, or how well your kids are doing in school. Won't have, I mean, all of those things are great. But if you want to be able to thrive, it actually comes on how much you actually believe these words we just read. We got to see the new creation that we've become because you and I are new. We're new. New. That means there's a different base we can function from. Revelation, John is like undone. It's the apostle, disciple. It's absolutely undone. He's got, a, he's got an open, supernatural revelation of the glorified Son of God. And he's before him. And he's like, John's melting, basically. He can't even stand. He's laid out on the floor. And he sees the glorified son of God and that glorified son of God steps forward in chapter 21, verse five. And he says, and he who's seated on the throne said, behold, I am making all things new. Write this down because these words are trustworthy and true. Now I want to say that again. These, are the, these aren't Pastor Keith's cool words. These are the words of the Son of God. Behold, I'm making all things new. Write it down because it's trustworthy and true. You are new. You're new. You aren't what you once were. You're brand new creation. I take old and I take what's broken and I make it new. And your ability to thrive in this life actually hinges upon how deeply you believe that word. That is not what Jesus says. Write it down because it's trustworthy and true. In fact, I challenge you to probably have it written down somewhere where you can't get away from it. You're new. You're new. If you're a follower of Jesus, you are new. You are changed. You have a new identity. You have a new name. If you're a follower of Jesus, you have a new identity and a new name. And he's calling us to lean in to this new identity. So what does that mean? What would that mean for me? 
What would I do if that was actually true? How would I live if that were really, really true? This is trustworthy and true. And church, this is what it means to be the church. It's what it means to be the church. We talk about church. Hear this. We're not talking about showing up on a Sunday to sing some songs and to hear some preaching. These are great, beautiful. In fact, uh, our worship this morning is so beautiful. This message is it's killing it right now. All right? <laughs> hear this. That's not why we're here. We're here because we've been changed. And changed. We are the church. There's a moment in scripture. I got to unpack it a little bit. I just want to take some more, just a few more minutes with it. I got to talk about it Sunday night. If you were here with us Sunday evening in Matthew chapter 16, I think you've turned there. Scripture captures, captures this moment where God wants to just fundamentally change a man. It's one of his followers. He'd been with him for a, a, a decent amount of time. And Jesus just transforms him in a moment. He says, I'm, I'm going to speak a new identity over you. And it's going to, you're going to operate completely in a different way as I speak this new identity over you. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 13, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, well, some say John the Baptist, and others say Elijah, and others, Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he said to him, but who do you say that I am? He's there with his disciples. He's in this town, by the way, that's known for its pagan worship. Caesarea Philippi is a place where a large temple and during the Greek years was built to the Greek god Pan. There was all kinds of sacrifices, prostitution, bestiality, all kinds of things that were taking place in this wretched area. It was going on uh, over hundreds of years and they're in this place. And so there's this question about all of these gods all of the time. So Jesus is forging ahead with a very relevant question. Who, who, everybody's talking and saying, well, maybe he's this, maybe he's that, maybe he's that. Here's my question for you. Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? Who do you say that I am? It's the most important question. I mentioned this last Sunday night. It's actually the most important question you'll ever be asked in your whole life. And you can't get away from this. All of humanity will be asked this question. Hear that? All of humanity will be asked this question, who do you say that I am? So he's navigating through this conversation with his disciples. Quite literally, the most important question he's ever asked, who do you say that I am? You understand this, by the way, this is the question that separates Ephesians chapter 2, 1 through 3 versus Ephesians chapter 2, verses 4 through 6. We read those two distinct sections of Scripture just a moment ago. This is the question that sits right in the middle between those two sections. You understand? This is the question that sits between those. And you may even be here this morning and find yourself not having answered this question with clarity. And the Lord just wants to be clear with you this morning, an opportunity for you to get clear about where you stand because he's gonna ask the question, who do you say that I am? Peter, uh, being the brave one of the group, always willing to put himself out there. You got to give the guy props because all the other disciples are like, oh, you know, and just Peter was always throwing himself out there. He's cutting off ears. He's just out there all the time, just constant, you know, like I'm out here, man. Love that guy. I really look forward to meeting him. I really do. I so appreciate his just like gumption 
and guts. And so Peter, in classic fashion, answers this question. You are the Christ. You're the son of the living God. Boom. Mic drop. I would drop this mic, but it's, it's expensive. I, kinda, I like to think that Jesus was waiting for this moment, looking for it. And Jesus answers him, dude, blessed. Full, alive, happy are you, Simon, son of Jonah, bar Jonah. For flesh and blood hasn't revealed this to you. It's impossible, by the way. But my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, Simon, you are Petros. You're Peter. Rock. And on this rock, I will build my church. And the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. You want to talk about Jesus doing in front of the man what we just read in Ephesians chapter 2. You are completely new. You had a trajectory in life that was dead. And I've come to save you and give you a new name and a new identity because you're no longer broken. You are rock. It's on you I'm going to build my church. But by the way, not just you, but on all who will make that confession, who do you say that I am? What he's actually saying there is there's something bigger going on. I'm changing your identity and I'm calling you into something new and I will build my church. By the way, first time you'll ever see the word church in the scripture. On this rock, I'll build my church. Transformative. And what he's saying is flesh and blood are not changing you. That's what he's saying. There is no flesh and blood that can change you. There's only one thing that can change you. My father who's in heaven sent his spirit to tell you the truth and change you. You've been changed because of him. And this is this moment of transformation. He steps into new name. You are the rock. And the significance, by the way, I don't know if if you've ever been to Caesarea Philippi. Uh, It it sits at the... the foot of Mount Hermon. This is the mountain that Jesus ascended when he was transfigured. We, he got blown up. We all saw his glory for like four seconds. And, was like, and the disciples were like, oh my gosh, undone. Well, this city sits down at the base of this mountain. It's got all kinds of rocks and cliffs. And there was, in fact, a massive cave. It, was, it is actually, in fact, still there today. It's still there today. This is a picture of me and my son in 2019. Is it there? Yeah. This, there's this cave right here. You see the rocks? See the rocks? Yeah, Luke's awesome. I look good with sunglasses. I'm going to be legit with you. I feel good about that, but um, there's a rock. You don't have to keep that picture up there, for, just for my son's sake. <laughs> Luke's like, please, for the love. It's like, dude, it's okay. We were all 12 once. Anyway, um, so... When, by the way, Jesus is looking at Peter and saying, you're the rock, understand. Uh, The belief was from all those pagan religions that lived there that the gods would come in and out through that cave. That was the gateway for the gods. And what they would do is they would hold big festivals, sacrifices, prostitution. They would do these huge festivals to try to pull the God of Pan out of Uh, hiding in a season. They would ask him to come back and be restored and come and have your way over our lives. It was known as the gateway of all of these gods to come back. And so that's what they do. And all those temples are built there. In fact, you don't get to see in all that picture 
There's, all, there's carvings in that rock all over the place where they would ask these gods to come back. And Jesus is looking at these things saying, hey, Peter, it's not on that rock. It's on this rock, not that rock, that I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail. Those places where we invite broken things, it won't stand any longer. You're different. You're changed. You're the rock, and all who will believe on me will be the rock. That is what it means to be the church. New I name, new name, new identity. New name, new identity. To believe and then to live and to step into what God has changed by Jesus changed by Jesus, not on our own and not by flesh and blood. It has to come from the Spirit of God. And you might even be in here wrestling right now. And here I'm here to tell you, the Spirit of God is knocking on the door of your heart to say, do you believe you can be made new? This is what it means to be the church. It's more than songs. It's more than meetings. It is a brand new identity we step into to see. Because not only are we here, this church is not, this, this word is not just for Peter, it's for us all. It's for us all to just to be able to be the church, but also to begin to build the church. See, we're changed by God and we're being transformed by God to help his church thrive. We're changed by God and we're being transformed by him so that his church can thrive. And I say that because it's probably important to just pause for a moment to remember uh, and to, to be honest that the church doesn't always have the best name. There have been a lot of horrible things done in the name of the church. There have been a lot of failure a lot of weaknesses and a lot of struggles, a lot of wounds caused by, if you will, the church, church leaders for that matter. Church often focuses a lot on itself and not on Jesus. I know the church isn't always a safe place even. So what do we do with that? And candidly, I know I'm flawed. We stand here as a leader in this church and you can, Question my family. It would tell you very quickly, I'm, I'm very flawed. So how do we do this? Well, one, we get to do what Jesus has said from the get-go is, I love for my power to be made manifest in weakness. Oh, my power is coming to those who are weak. We're all weak. The question is, will we open up our hands and say it? and say, God, come and change me. I'm weak. So I'm sad for the ways that the church or the name church has been maligned. But hear this, the church are the people of God who are brand new creations in which God is ready to come and build his kingdom in and through and among us. As the church, we've been perfectly changed and yet we're being transformed. How that, I don't know how that works. I'm just, I, it, it blows my mind when I think about it. Right now, you are perfectly changed. Holy, righteous, redeemed, restored, fully and completely. This is your position in Christ. And yet, you are being transformed every day more and more into his image. How do those two things coexist? I don't know. I just know it's true. And I want to lean into it. I want God to do works of transformation in me. How does it work? Honestly, Peter's the best example. We got here, Jesus looking at him, say, Peter, you're the rock. Or Simon, you're now Peter. Petros, you're the rock. And on this rock, he's looking at Peter. It's really all the disciples. This is where I'm building my church. And Satan will not prevail, and you're going to live out a new identity. And then what happens? 
Peter has one of maybe the most colossal failure that we've seen in all of Scripture. He's like looking Jesus in the face. I'll never fail you. I'll never fail you. I will never fail you. I guarantee it. And Jesus says, brother, don't guarantee things you can't hold on to. And Peter radically fails. Not once, not twice, three times abandoned. He's nowhere to be found. Jesus is hanging on a cross and Peter is not there. Boom. Failure. This is the rock. Have you ever felt that snide question from the enemy over yourself? This is the rock? You're the one that God's using? You're the church? You ever heard that? Now, you know Peter was hearing that because in John chapter 21, he's left the ministry. He's gone back to fishing. He's like, Jesus said, you'd be fishers of men. And he went with him. He failed. And he was like, I'm back to fish. I don't qualify to fish for men. I've failed. You hear that? You've been there? And so Jesus, after he's risen from the dead, he's all over on the side, and they're making breakfast. And Peter sees that it's Jesus, and you can feel that craziness in him again because he jumps out of the boat and swims to the shore. Dang, that guy's, he's a, a Tasmanian mess. It's awesome. I love it. So grateful for his story. Come on. He swims over. He's there. He's sitting there, and Jesus just confronts his shame. He's got toxic shame. Do you love me? He asks him three times. You know, that's how painful that is. Come on. Three times Peter denies Jesus. Three times Jesus looks him dead in the eye. Do you love me? Do you love me? And he's saying, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. And the third time, he's like, Darn it, you know all things. That's what he says. You know all things. You know I do. And he says, then get back to your identity. Feed my sheep. Get back to your identity. Feed my sheep. You are the church. Do not back down because you have failed or fallen short, church. Rise up in humility and say, I blew it. But thank you, God, that your power is made perfect in my weakness. I am the church. I'll be the church. And we won't try to gloss over it to the broken world outside. We'll say, no, we're totally broken. That's why we're here. Come on in. That's the church. That's what this church will be. It's why we change our name. It's not for our name. New River will never be thought of again. It's going to be the name of Jesus. We just want to be known as New River Church. We are the church, the changed of God, the transformed of God. That's our name. That's our cry. That's our heart. So when we talk about church and we look at our days ahead, and we have fresh vision. We're asking God, would you build an authentic community that is being changed and transformed by the power and the presence of God? That's what we want. That's what this church is going to be about changed by the radical love of God, transformed by his power for God to use us like he did that mess of a man called Peter. Do you believe he could use you? You won't believe he can use you. It's time to go. You guys come on up. Sorry. We got communion here. Listen to him. We're going to get our hearts ready. Here's my question. In fact, y'all just let's get our hearts ready. Here, here's the question. We get to ruminate on. You won't believe that you were meant to touch the lives of people and build his church if you don't first believe that you're a, you have a new name and a new identity. Would you ask this question? I'm just asking right now, Lord. As we prepare our hearts to receive the Lord's Supper, to receive the bread the broken body of Christ to receive the cup, the shed blood that has changed and transformed us. Here's my question for you. Here's my question.
Do you believe that God has made you a new creation? And if so, what is he saying over you? Would you ask him like he did with Peter? What's my name? Ask him. This is maybe even an awkward question for you. I want you to ask him right now. Lord, what's my name? Might not be a In fact, it's possible he won't even say a name like John or Peter. But he wants to speak a word over you. When you ask God, what is my name? Ask him. If I'm a new creation, what is my name? What do you say over me? What's your word over me? identity. What's my identity? Ask him. What's my identity? If that word aligns with the truth of scripture and you say, thank you, God, let me live as a new creation today. And if all you are hearing were lies telling you you're not good enough, you're not loved, and you hear that harassing voice of the enemy in your heart, in your mind, and you tell him, leave, the gates of hell don't prevail. Leave. Jesus, you speak. In a moment, I'm going to invite you to come and receive the Lord's Supper. As soon as you come and you receive the elements, you can take them or you can take them back to your seat. Our team's going to worship over us, inviting the presence of God, changed and transformed by the power and presence of God. So would you invite the presence of God to lead you now as you remember Jesus' body that was broken, his blood that was shed for you? Y'all stand with me as I pray, cover us. You're free to take this communion if you're a follower of Jesus. You've been changed and transformed. There's zero pressure for you to take. If you're not ready to take it this morning, you don't have to. But this is an open invitation to step into your identity. Changed and transformed by the power and presence of God. Power of what Jesus did on the cross. Jesus, would you lead us triumphantly as we come to receive these elements. We love you and we thank you. It's in your name we pray. Amen.